Welcome back everyone to the lecture about applied biometric analysis. This part will be about volumetric image processing. I will introduce you to some terminology at the very beginning. That's a short part actually. Then we will have a look at three-dimensional image exploration and visualization in Fiji and in Python. And I will show you a bit how to process images in 3D. And as I will not go into much detail in, in how image processing is done itself, I will just show how to do it in 3D. Those of you who haven't, don't know what a filter is and uh, have forgotten maybe what image segmentation means, and there is just a reminder of the lecture at the very beginning of this semester. When we talked about images and image processing, we were talking about pixels. If uh, a pixel is a picture element, and if we talk about three-dimensional image processing, we have to talk about the volume element. Um, and they are usually anisotropic. And I would like to explain a bit in detail what anisotropic, what that means in the context of voxels. So when we look at an image in 2D, usually we have a coordinate system X and Y. And in the very most cases, pixels have the same size in X and Y. So for example, one micron wide and one micron high. In three-dimensional image processing, the third dimension, the, the Z is in, in many cases in microscopy and in medical imaging not as large as X and Y. The Z, the, the voxel size in Z is usually different. And that means it is not isotropic. It does not have the same size in all three dimensions. And it's different, usually different in Z. And uh, this is basically how it looks like. So if I take my three-dimensional image and look at a single plane, then it looks like that. If I now take my three-dimensional image and look at all pixels which are along this line but in the third dimension, I get an image out like that with the coordinate system Y and Z and no longer X and Y. And uh, if you zoom into such an image, you will realize that it looks a little bit weird in Z dimension, in the Z direction, compared to an image zoomed in in XY. It's stripey. And this stripiness is actually, the, the, the let's call it a problem, but it's, it's something we have to deal with. I'm just saying here that image analysts love to have isotropic voxels just because for convenience reason and they don't have to think about it. But in many cases, it's from a technological point of view, not really possible to get that. For example, just if you would acquire um, the whole 3D volume with isotropic voxels, and um, there would be too much light into the little animal and the animal would die because of phototoxicity. So you have to find a trade-off between as isotropic as possible and uh, <laughs> not killing the animal while imaging it. To iterate a bit on that and what it actually means for, especially for image processing, for example, for cell detection, cell segmentation. So this is a histological slice. Um, and we see here in, in violet, we see cell nuclei. And when you look at such an image, and the pixel dimensions in X and in Y is, uh, is, a, is with a ratio 1 to 1. So we clearly nicely see this nuclei. I will now reduce, for, for just for demonstration purposes, I will change this ratio and I will uh, re reduce the amount of pixels in the Y direction. If we have a factor of 1 to 2, so the, the image has 250 pixels in width, but just 125 in height which are isotropic, so the voxel size is different, so that's why it's still a square, we still can differentiate nuclei, right? So it is still possible. A factor of 1 to 2 in this context, nice, okay, fine. If we go further down to, for example, a factor to 1 to 5, it becomes already one of these cases where you cannot be 100% sure anymore. So when we look at nuclei like these two here, we can still see them. But if I search a little bit longer in this image, for example, here in this region, it becomes harder to really identify the objects. And when I increase the ratio uh, to 1 to 10, it becomes clearly impossible to, uh, to count the correct number of nuclei compared to the original image. Isotropic voxels are not bad, not bad in general. But uh, as soon as the factor becomes high, it becomes complicated to process these images. If the number of pixels in one direction in comparison to the, the size of the objects we are looking at, if it becomes too small, then we can't differentiate objects anymore. I will come back to this in a second. Furthermore, depending on what imaging technique you use. In medical imaging, I think it's more important than in microscopy, but also in microscopy, these things happen. That's why I would like to 
introduce you to the difference between slice distance and slice thickness. So let's assume we are here in X and Z dimension and we acquire images, um, for example, with five pixels in X and we have here three slices imaged with a distance between them. So there's, that's, that's what slice distance means, right? And we can also uh, configure the slice thickness. So for example, we could make the slice thickness thicker um, than the distance. Then we would have overlapping pixels in Z dimension. So, and independent from, our, from how our microscope was acquiring that image or our MRI, um, our software usually shows us something like that. And I just want you to be aware of that while configuring your microscope or your imaging device, that you can do these things, it makes a lot of sense, but you may not see the difference afterwards in, in, in the software. The software will not tell you that this or that was done. You have to think about that yourself. You have to keep that in mind yourself. Um, it becomes especially important when you think about objects which are smaller than the slice distance, so for example, there is a nucleus sitting here. It was not imaged <laughs> because we didn't hit it. Um, and that's why this image doesn't show this particular nucleus. Or alternatively, we had a nucleus sitting here. We imaged it twice in that plane and in that plane. And then it appears in our image larger than it actually is. So this is just to, to, to raise awareness for the difference between slice distance and slice thickness. And that brings us to the nucleus channel sampling theory. Ooh, it comes a bit from signal processing and from, from, from information theory. I would like to, to shape it a bit in a very simple way. Let's assume we do a signal intensity measurement every micron. So this is kind of we measure pixels, right? Every, with a distance of a micron in a one-dimensional space. Then we get kind of these measurements. We see here a measurement at position minus three. We see here a measurement at position minus two, minus one, zero, and so on. Um, and we see here three potential images we could have got uh, in, in, in our reality. I mean, it's not images. It's then we have three potential realities <laughs> matching to our image. And we cannot tell if red, green, or blue is actually there uh, in, in reality because we only have these measurements at these particular distances. If we wanted to have more information about the scene we are imaging, we have to, we have to decrease the pixel size, for example, half a micron, and we have to increase the number of pixels per micron. That's the opposite way of doing the same thing. Uh, and then if we miss objects, if we don't see them, we do something like undersampling. Uh, and if we oversample, if we increase the number of pixels per micron so much that we have to put a lot of light into our sample, it may be possible that we are killing it. Right, so this is again the trade-off I mentioned earlier. And there is no general solution for doing either this or doing either that. Um, but there is a rule of thumb um, which can help us. And it has something to do with the size of the objects we are looking at. And you also have to think a bit about what is the object we are actually looking at. So if we want to see a cell and we just want to know how many cells there are, we don't want to look to inside the cell, we just want to know that there are cells, then we should acquire images with approximately a third, at least a half, but better a third of the size of a cell. So be sure that a cell is there, we should have three pixels at least uh, in order to figure out if, if there was a cell or not. And I can visualize it a little bit more in detail. So we have these two cells, theoretical cells. And how many pixels do we need in order to acquire them? So we have two cells and we can start with two pixels. So I have here a pixel on the left and I have a pixel on the right. And now I do a measurement, right? I me measure the mean intensity in these two pixels. Pixel number one, pixel number two. And the mean intensity is something like that. So if we look at that from a very broad distance and we see these two pixels next to each other with the same signal intensity, we cannot differentiate these two objects which were there. So obviously the we, we oversampled and we cannot see the nuclei. Let's now measure eight pixels. So these eight pixels for our two cells, mean intensity again, the image looks like that. And we can still not differentiate these two nuclei, right? And we can go further down and at some point, so also here it doesn't work, at some point we may be lucky that we see local maxima. So we have now a pixel size, which is half of the size of the object, so of the nuclei. If we wanted to see the nuclei, we should start with two or three times the pixels and the nuclei. 
So this is the starting point where it may make sense, but in order to be sure to have really like a pixel size which allows us really differentiating these nuclei, we have to go much further down. And this has something to do with the fact we do not want to see the nuclei, we want to see the gap between the nuclei. So if we want to differentiate nuclei from each other, we have to acquire something like two or three pixels at least in the gap between them. Because otherwise we will identify the the the, 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 nu the nuclei um, as one independent thing, as not as several things. So this is just a visualization of the nucleus channel sampling theorem in the image analysis, in the imaging context. In the very practical case, how does this look in, in daily practice when you do microscopy? I would recommend a strategy approximately like, like that. You take, you go to your microscope, to your favorite microscope, and you take a two-dimensional image of the biological sample you want to look at. Um, and you load this, for example, in image there, but any other software can do that as well. And if you want to differentiate nuclei, like in this case here, for example, you zoom in to, uh, to two very close nuclei and you draw a line here and you measure the distance between these nuclei. So that is here in this particular case, it's something like 0.7 micron. And that means we have to use, for example, a, a pixel size or voxel size of 0.2 micron in order to see the gap between these two nuclei. And this is the, the ideal condition. And then your microscopist may tell you, yeah, 0.2 microns, um, the resolution of the microscope does not allow it. <laughs> Or we put too much light into the sample and we kill it, and then you have to you have to use a trade-off. Then you can then just maybe use 0.3, 0.5 micron, whatever. And but this this is the the ideal condition. This is the the, the where you want to go with this. Uh, then you have to find a good trade-off, uh, not harming your sample too much and still getting reasonably good images out. When you switch from two-dimensional image processing to three-dimensional image processing, there's also another thing which is. It's it's kind of trivial, but I nevertheless wanted to show it. So uh, you remember that we had we talked about dilation and erosion earlier, and when you apply a dilation to a two-dimensional image where a single pixel is white, um, you get nine pixels out, um, which are white afterwards. So that's a binary dilation, and if it is nine pixels or if it's five afterwards, um, depends on which neighborhood was taken into account. In some software packages, this thing is also called structuring element. So do we take eight neighbors into account or do we take four neighbors into account? The structuring element of the dilation operation tells us that. And if you switch to a three dimensions, of course, we have to consider this thing as a three dimension, I think. Um, so the Moore neighborhood and the von Neumann neighborhood are also defined for three dimensions, have then not any more eight and four neighbors, but 26 or six. Um, and uh, I think it's quite intuitive to, to keep these numbers in mind. But I'm not sure if I ever heard somebody talking about the 26th neighborhood. Maybe we are talking about a cube and a diamond shape or something, or a, a circular or an ellipsoidal shape um, when we go towards um, 3D. Okay, that's so far for the terminology. Next part will be about three-dimensional image visualization in Fiji. See you soon.